William Hamblin is professor of history at BYU. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Michigan. He specializes in ancient warfare for the most part and is most recently the co-author with David Seeley of the Thames and Hudson book Solomon's Temple Myth and History which uh, we all highly recommend. Uh, he's also been kicked out of Pakistan by the United States government if I remember correctly. So uh, his paper is uh, what is the chariot in Ezekiel 1? So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hamlet. Well, uh, I should tell you that Dan, uh, I asked Dan for more time. He said uh, he wouldn't give me any more than anybody else. And then he asked me to write a letter of recommendation for him. <laughs> well, I thought he was smarter than that, but I guess not. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, Ezekiel's chariot, and uh, I think there are some interesting connections with the temple, so we'll just proceed. Uh, I've got uh, too much stuff, so I will stop blabbering and just start talking. But I do have a, a new class that we're doing this winter uh, called Temples and Civilizations. Uh, it's History 390R, so if any students here are interested, uh, they can come take this and we can go into a lot of more detail on some of these things. Now, I should say that uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is somewhat speculative. Uh, the problem, of course, is that lack of data and ambiguity of data means that a lot of what we have to say about Ezekiel's chariot has to be speculative. So, you know, take it for what it's worth, but, um, you know, I recognize that some of it's tenuous, but I think there's some interesting things. Now, Ezekiel, we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 1 mainly, but also chapter 10, which kind of repeats and uh, amplifies some of the things found in chapter 1. I'm using, uh, for the quotations I'll present, the NRSV. It's based on the King James, but, but uh, modified to some degree, so you can follow along in King James versions, look up some of the th same things there. Basically, uh, these chapters are visions of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a, prophet, uh, a priest in the temple, he went into exile in Babylon, and while there he had visions of uh, a number of different things, including kind of an eschatological temple in chapters 40 to 48. But in this uh, particular, these two chapters, 1 and 10, he's seen this uh, strange uh, vehicle. He doesn't actually call it uh, a Merkaba, but uh, later tradition does. So what I'm going to do is essentially argue that the, what Ezekiel's Merkabah represents is a, is a portable Holy of Holies from the temple. So it's a, it's a mobile temple on wheels, if you will. And I'm just going to go through different passages in Ezekiel, do some comparison with some other passages, and take a look at uh, some of the evidence for this. The first thing to note is Ezekiel in chapter 1 talks about the chayot, or the uh, four living creatures, these, these strange composite beings. Uh, but later in the chapter, in uh, 10, 15, and 20, he talks about cherubim, which are the uh, creatures or divine beings that are found in the Holy of Holies. Now, cherubim are mentioned in a number of different contexts, mainly in, however, in association with the Garden of Eden or in association with the Temple or association with the throne of God. That's basically it. Now, they're often equated with, with angels, but in fact, they're never called angels as far as I can tell in the Old Testament. Um, but cherubim are mentioned in the Holy of Holies, and there's four of them. There's two on the ark, and then there's two beside the ark that have their wings overarching on top of the ark. So there's four uh, chayot, or cherubim, in Ezekiel's uh, vision. There's four in the Holy of Holies. So that's the first uh, parallel that you've got. Now, these uh, cherubs have four faces, and this is rather an odd thing. Uh, they also have four wings. So they're described in, in very strange terms. What you can see on this particular panel here is the, uh, the four faces are a human lion, ox, and eagle in uh, one six, but they are a cherub, human, lion, and eagle in 1014. Now, the obvious connection there, the green words, is that the ox and the cherub face of a cherub is the face of an ox or, or a cow. It's a bovine face. That uh, leads us to one possible speculation that the, the 12 oxen holding the brazen sea are described as oxen could be uh, understood as cherubim because they have the face of a cherub as described in Ezekiel. Now, in, from the ancient Near Eastern context, we have a number of, of examples of these types of beings. 
I don't want to call them angels because that's kind of a, a later assumption. I would, I think they're associated with what uh, the Bible calls the, the sons of God. That they're sons of God, and those overlap with the angels to some extent. But uh, here you can see a, an example from uh, Ein Dara, a little bit earlier than Solomon's temple, but roughly the same period. And you can see these uh, creatures here. You've got a lion, human, bull, and uh, eagle head. So exactly the same faces as described in Ezekiel's uh, vision. And they're holding something up, presumably the, the celestial realm or something like that. You know, the heavens holding the, something along those lines. So there's a, you know, kind of contextualization of what they may have looked like. Now we've also got um, another characteristic of the cherubs in Ezekiel is that their wings are touching. The only other place in the Bible where, where the wings of cherubs are described as touching each other is um, in the Holy of Holies, where the wings of the cherubs overarch and, and, and touch one another. There's a number of uh, ancient Near Eastern examples of this type of thing. This is from Arslan Tash. It's an Egyptianizing, Egyptianizing uh, work, but you can see uh, two flanking uh, beings there with their wings touching. This is a tomb of Ai for 13th century. You can see again the creatures here on the corners. They're on the four corners of the sarcophagus and their wings are outstretched, almost touching the arrow overlapping here. Then you've got um, uh, this example, which might be more pertinent to our particular uh, discussion, and that is you've got something being borne by priests, and it's, it's a solar bark or a royal bark, and on it you've got these flanking figures with the wings touching and overlapping. Now, the, in the Egyptian tradition, I think the, uh, the solar bark played the role of the, the chariot in, in more Mesopotamian and Syrian related traditions. Here's another one from Egypt. And, and in this particular case, again, you've got the priest bearing the throne, and it's in the form of a portable shrine. You see, it's, it's supposed to be a, a sacred room flanked by lion creatures and these composite creatures, and then the king and the, and the winged uh, figures uh, kind of overarching and, and touching or protecting him. So that's probably, uh, you know, the, the ancient Near Eastern context for these types of ideas. So the second parallel then is, is the existence of cherubs, then you've got the wings touching, which is unique to the Holy of Holies in Ezekiel's vision. There's also a discussion of coals of fire. Within this uh, vehicle that Ezekiel sees, it's got these cherubs and wheels and, and uh, different things. He talks about the fire being there, and he talks about coals you can get from this fire. Now he never explicitly describes it as an altar, but in other passages like Isaiah 6, 6 and Revelation 8, 5, it's clear that the coals of fire that the angels are getting uh, are come from the incense altar, and that's, again, associated with the inner rooms of the temple. So probably uh, coals from the altar is another parallel, and that what Ezekiel's got inside these cherubs is, is this altar. Uh, big question arises is, is what Ezekiel's describing a, a, a chariot? Now, the technical term is Merkaba. Uh, and he never calls it that. He just says, you know, he calls it gal gal, he calls it all sorts of different things. He never calls it explicitly a chariot. However, uh, Jewish tradition saw it in that way, and of course the rabbis go wild with this stuff. We're not going to get into the rabbinic stuff. That's a whole other story. But Sirach 49.8 uh, explicitly talked about Ezekiel's vision and says what he saw was the chariot of the cherubim. And there's another example of this from the temple in 1 Chronicles 28.18, you can see there. There was a golden chariot of cherubim in the temple, and they had their wings spread out, just like Ezekiel is describing. Now, this, this is inside the temple. Uh, what exactly it was, we don't know. We have very little data about this, but uh, my assumption is that whatever Ezekiel is seen is probably related to this golden chariot of the cherubim. Now, it may be also the same thing as the chariot of the sun. Because Josiah, during his reformations, um, uh, destroyed or removed this chariot of the sun, he calls it. And it may have been a different vehicle, but my assumption is that the solar chariot, the cherubim chariot, and what Ezekiel says are probably parallel concepts. Uh, again, sometimes these links are tenuous, but that's kind of what I'm working on, uh, towards. Here you can see a wheeled uh, vehicle with chariots on it. Uh, this is from Cyprus, but you've got these winged uh, creatures. This is a bad picture. I couldn't find a better one, but... Uh, and then the wheels down here. This is a bronze laver that they push around and use it to wash their hands and, and uh, purify stuff in, in a temple context. 
Uh, divine chariots are also known from other uh, sources, and here's uh, some Mesopotamian ones, where you can see the strange winged figure is pulling the chariot, and then you can see the, the gods and so forth associated with that. You've got a four-wheeled one up on top, a two-wheeled one at the bottom. And there's some very nice descriptions of chariots used, uh, god chariots, that were made by Sumerians, and they had them in their temples, and the Gudea inscriptions. I've given some sources there where you can find uh, more details on that. I don't have time to go into that, but that, that's another uh, possible parallel in that context. So, uh, next parallel is the is Ezekiel is describing a wheeled vehicle of some sort and uh, possibly linked or probably linked in my view to the cherub chariot or the chariot of the sun that is described in being in the temple. Now there's another characteristic of Ezekiel's uh, description that, that there's a throne involved in this. Now there's a, there's a rakia or a dome or a firmament in the King James Version above these chariots and they're holding it up apparently or you know it's somehow associated with them and then on top of this is, is a throne. Uh, and of course, the throne is the throne of God. Concept is uh, central to uh, the Holy of Holies, that the mercy seat. This is God's throne, and so forth, associated with the temple. So we've got a possible uh, connection there. This is an interesting artistic source of what they might be thinking about. This is from a few centuries after um, Ezekiel, but is probably a chariot throne with a God seen on it. It says Yahud in the coin, so it's you know maybe Jewish, maybe uh, pagan associated with it, but at any rate, how to exactly interpret it is a question. All right, so we've got then also the throne of God associated with both the Merkaba and the Holy of Holies. So this is leading to my first speculation that the Merkaba is a wheeled Holy of Holies. It's a portable Holy of Holies that, that you can move around. Now, Holy of Holies is probably the earthly representation of the real thing, which is the celestial one, and that's what Ezekiel seen. You know, it's, it's the, the earthly one is the, is the poor imitation of the real thing. Another aspect of this, however, is that I think we've got a lot of uh, astronomical symbolism involved in this chariot, and we'll a look, take a look at some of the things in that regard here. One example we already briefly alluded to was the, the fact that Ezekiel describes the cherubs as carrying a rakia, or a firmament, or a dome is, is probably a better translation from the NRSV. It's over their heads, it's above them. Now this term is precisely the same term in, found in Genesis 1-6 for the dome of heavens. There's this rakia, this big arched uh, dome, and God's throne is, is sometimes described as being up on top of this. Now rakia can be another, other things, it's not exclusively a technical term for this, but you may have an astronomical connection in this regard that the, you know, there's a dome representing the heavens and, and that type of thing. There's also Near Eastern examples of, uh, of cherub-like creatures bearing divine beings. Now this one is from the Achaemenid period, a Persian. Here you've got a uh, god, probably a Mazda in a Persian context. And here you've got uh, strange creatures with the feet, hooked feet of uh, bulls, which is how Ezekiel describes the cherub. They've got four wings and they're raising their arms and they're holding up uh, Ahura Mazda. So probably they're, they're dealing with something along this, those lines. Here's a 14th century example from Megiddo where you've got numerous uh, creatures holding up what I would say is the heavens. I mean, what, what they're holding you can debate, it's, of course. But you've got multiple faces on this one. This one looks to me like an eagle, but who knows? This one has bull-like with the horns. Uh, this one down here, there's human ones and so forth. And then these composite creatures with wings. So, something along those lines is probably what Ezekiel is, is describing here. So, first astronomical symbol is that there's a, a firmament or a rakia uh, associated with this uh, vehicle. We've also got the, the chariots. Now, elsewhere in, in Jewish scripture, in the Psalms, the Lord is described as riding a chariot on the wings of the wind, and then he's also described as riding a cherub on the wings of the wind, exactly parallel uh, ideas. So you've got cherub and chariot overlapping here in this particular case, but the, the question is, what type of chariot? What is this chariot supposed to represent? Now, we've already seen uh, this slide before, but you've got, uh, you know, wheels mentioned in these types of things, chariot of the cherubim here, but here it's called a chariot of the sun. Now, th this is in um, Second Kings. Of course, it may be describing three different things. 
it's, I'm conflating them, right? It's quite possible that the chariot of the sun was one thing, the, chariot, the golden chariot of the cherubim was another thing, and Ezekiel's chariots is something entirely different. But we do have this tradition of a solar chariot attached to the temple, uh, once in its construction and once in the destruction of this chariot. And if the cherubim chariot and the solar chariot are the same, then, then we've got this astronomical symbolism. So it's possible then we've got um, a solar motif in this. We also have a strange thing called the wheel work. Now this is Galgal in Hebrew and what this is, is, is again, much of this stuff is obscure in Ezekiel. And it doesn't help it to read it in Hebrew, it just makes it worse to understand. It's much better to read it in translation because at least the translators made it clear, right? What Ezekiel's talking about is often obscure, but it's very evocative even though not, not uh, clear. But he talks about these wheels, he talks about wheels within wheels, and then he calls them a Galgal, which translates wheel work in uh, NRSV. There's, I've listed several different passages in Ezekiel where he talks about this. Now what specifically that is, of course, can be debated, but, but Galgal, th this root, refers uh, in, in a sense to a skull. It can be a wheel, but it can also be a spherical thing. So in other words, it's skull-shaped. And that would, that would indicate to me a, a possibility of a sphere. And if you've got a wheel within a wheel, in this particular case, this is a Christian piece of art, much later, but it shows you one conceptualization of this, that there's one wheel this way and the other wheel this way, and then combined together they form two wheels hooked together forming a sphere. Now, whether that's what Ezekiel intended, of course, we can be debated, but that, that's one uh, possible optional interpretation of this. However, if we turn to later Jewish sources, and this is a thousand years after Ezekiel and maybe a completely different tradition, but you've got uh, examples, I'm, I'm going to show you three, of um, s solar figures on chariots surrounded by wheels within wheels. And these are the zodiac mosaics uh, from Jewish synagogues from the 4th through the 6th century in northern Israel. So this one's from uh, Tiberius, this is one of the earliest ones, and it's damaged by later constructions on top of it, but you can see wheels within wheels, you see these circles, Ezekiel talks about eyes on the wheels and stuff. And then you've got a figure here who's clearly a solar figure. He's got the, the, the halo and the seven beams, solar beams on top. And notice he's holding in his hand a sphere of some sort. Probably the moon, but I mean, what exactly it is can be debated. I'll, this slide shows a little closer. Uh, and you've got uh, these figures, lions and other bulls and things like that associated with figures Ezekiel describes. And then you've got this uh, figure up close with the beams of suns off his head and then holding, I guess, a lunar sphere. At any rate, you've got then this, these exemplars of the wheel within wheel idea. Here you've got another one. This one's a little bit bad or hard to see. This is a brand new, a brand new discovered one a few years ago in Sephoris, or Zephoria in northern Israel. And here you've got the wheel, here you've got another wheel. And then in, in this, you've got a chariot figure, but instead of showing a, a human form, which is what Ezekiel describes and what the Tiberius one has, you have a, a pillar with a sun disk on it. This is a close-up of that. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the slide with it, but there's a sun disk right here, the beams coming off in all directions, uh, riding in a solar chariot. Now, these are, in one sense, pagan illustrations of Apollo riding his solar chariot. I mean, you can find earlier examples of exactly these type of things, but read within the context of Ezekiel, we might be seeing something along those lines. The Beit Alpha one is interesting here. This is 6th century. It's got exactly the same stuff. The artist was obviously someone with my skills instead of the skills of somebody like Michael Lyon in terms of art. But uh, you've got the figure. You've got the solar burst off his head. You've got the sun, the moon, and the stars represented here. He's riding a chariot. He's surrounded by wheels within wheels. And the four figures representing the seasons are winged, just as the cherubims are described, as, as being these winged creatures forming the four corners. So, uh, the other option, oh, um, here's showing them all together, just so you can see. This was a common motif in, in uh, late synagogues, late antique synagogues. Now, this solar figure, uh, just, just to show you what we're talking about, this is Apollo. This one is, is presumably the Lord, but maybe just the sun in the Tiberius. And this one, who's this? This is Jesus. One of the earliest depictions we have of Jesus is riding a solar chariot with the seven beams of the sun off his head. This is from the Vatican Grottoes right around 300. And as I said, it's one of the very earliest depictions we have of, of Jesus. So, 
this wheel work I'm suggesting is symbolic of the planetary spheres, possibly. It's maybe a stretch, but you get that sense there. Uh, there's also cherubs associated with the veil. Uh, Ezekiel doesn't associate them in his description, but cherubs are in Ezekiel's vision, and in Exodus 26.1, the cherubs are, are sewn into as, as uh, tapestries onto the curtain, the, the veil of the temple. But Josephus, thousands, you know, hundreds of years later, says that the veil had a panorama on the, of the heavens, but not the zodiac. You must make clear what they're showing is not the pagan zodiac, but a Jewish view of the heavens. Now, if we conflate these two, and we say the cherubim are on the veil, and the veil is a panorama of the heavens, then the cherubim become constellations, and the eyes that are on them become stars. Uh, because they're covered, described as being covered with eyes on their wings and body and wheels, everything has eyes on them. We'll get to that in just a second. Okay? So that, that leads to these speculations. Are the cherubim constellations? And are they therefore the stars of heaven, or the host of heaven, or the sons of God? All these things are, are equated here. So you've got Josiah, who, when he does his reforms of the temple, um, closes down the people who worship the sun, the moon, the constellations, and the host of heaven. Now, if they're worshiping that in the temple, they may be associating these with the cherubim figures. And Job, of course, says, the morning stars sang together, and the sons of God shouted for joy. He's equating these stars with sons of God. And so if you conceptualize that as possibly a, uh, you know, a constellation figures representing the heavens, because the stars are always mapped out in terms of strange creatures in these old cultures. Uh, also, Ezekiel talks about eyes. Now, what these eyes are, they're on the wheels, they're on the wings of the cherubim, they're all over the place. What they are is hard to say, but eyes are also associated with the seven lamps of the menorah here, and a stone, a gemstone, is said to have seven eyes, probably meaning facets. It's got seven cuts on it, something like that. So eye could be, uh, um, this is a bit of a stretch perhaps, but the eye could be a um, symbolic representation of the stars as well on these. So that's another possibility. Now, uh, so what I'm suggesting is two things. One, the temple, or the uh, Ezekiel's chariot is the Holy of Holies, portable Holy of Holies, mobile one, and two, that all the symbolism associated with it has astronomical features because the Holy of Holies is from the heavens or is the heavens. Now, do we have any historical examples of, of these types of things? I'll run through this real quick, but we've got a very interesting tradition in India that is exactly parallel to this. Uh, this is called the uh, Jagannatha festival or the Ratha Yatra, which means the chariot pilgrimage. And what they do is they create, they build giant wooden chariots, turn them into temples, put the images of the god on them, and then drag them through the, the town. And a huge pilgrimage festival. You see, there's literally hundreds of thousands of people coming to this. These are the, these are portable things. They're made out of wood, and they carry an image of the god in the center, and the people pull them through the streets. Now, this is an early 19th century lithograph by a Briton, a British uh, guy who saw the same thing. So they've been doing this for a long time. We have historical documents that can put this back even further. Here's some more uh, exemplars of this. This is showing you the temple. That everybody's crowded up on it as they're pulling it through. So this is a wheeled, portable temple. This one is very interesting because... It's a, it's a miniature version of this. They have this big festival where they make these giant ones, but they have smaller ones. You can see the four wheels, it's square in shape, and you've got these four creatures on each of the corners with their hands up, right? Paralleling, broadly speaking, how Ezekiel is describing this. Now, we know these uh, chariot temples went back very uh, much earlier in India. These are kind of contemporary things that they still do. And that's what's interesting about the Indian tradition is it's a living temple tradition Whereas you can't go see a, how an Egyptian temple worked anymore. I mean, it's just gone. It's archaeology and art and texts. The Indians are still doing this. I mean, they do this every year. They have all these festivals. But here's one from uh, the 16th century. And you can see a temple structure as a wheeled vehicle. The most famous exemplar of this is at um, Konarak. This one is a huge temple and these giant wheels on it. This is, in fact, the temple of the sun god, Surya. It's a solar temple. The chariot is a temple. The temple is a chariot. There are overlapping concepts there. Here's a close-up of the wheel. Now, if you turn this, the, remember, Surya is the name of the Hindu sun god. He's, he rides this chariot temple around through the heavens. 
if you turn this into a two-dimensional mandala, what you end up with is this. This is Surya. He's flanked by these uh, the celestial creatures. He's in his chariot. It's pulled by horses. And then he's surrounded by the spheres, the decans, different interpretations. And in the four corners of these four strange guardian creatures. Now that is how the Hindus conceptualize in two dimensions the Surya, portable Surya, so solar chariot temple that we just showed pictures of. And then when you compare these two diagrams, you can see that, that fundamentally you've got the same overall structure. Now whether there's an exact connection, of course, can be debated because these are distant traditions. But clearly the, the Indians, the Iranians, they all interacted. I mean, these people were interacting in various ways. But here you've got the four creatures in the corners, their wing. Here you've got the four creatures. You've got the wheels within wheels of the celestial bodies. These are planets and constellations and so forth. And then you've got the charioteer here in the center, who is God on his uh, solar chariot. Now, that's from India. Do we have any Jewish examples of a wheeled chariot temple? Well, in fact, we do from uh, Capernaum from the fourth century AD. This is clearly a, a temple structure. It's on four wheels, and it may, in fact, represent Ezekiel's portable chariot uh, temple shrine. Now, this is a very late. This is hundreds of years after Ezekiel. Maybe, in fact, it might be something entirely different. Again, this is speculative. Nobody quite understands what that's supposed to represent. But I would suggest that it may be this uh, chariot temple. So, conclusions are these are speculative and tentative conclusions that the chariot is a, is a wheeled portable holy of holies. That's what it's supposed to represent. Uh, and it is the one from heaven, it's the real one, whereas the earthly one is just a pale imitation of that. And then secondly, and, and it should be equated with the chariots of the cherubim and the chariot of the sun, described as being in the, in the first temple. And secondly, that Ezekiel's chariot is probably symbolic a uh, microcosm of astronomical things from the heavens. Constellations, the sun, the moon, the seasons. Could be lots of different things involved in the changing faces. The four faces may be four phases of the moon. I mean, there's no way to know, but, but there's lots of ways this astronomical data could be interconnected. All right, uh, I guess we're done. Is, uh, do we have time for questions, or should we just shut it down right now? Right. We're out of time, right? Um, we've got a 15-minute break before the next uh, block of sessions begins. So. Anybody want to ask questions? Feel free. If you want to leave, uh, also feel free. Yes? The, the, the Whatever the text is, you're going to use through. Well, I'm just using, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm using just standard textbooks, yeah. Um, so I don't have a particular text. Well, I actually, I'm using one of the books I wrote, the Solomon Temple book, but okay. yeah. Anything else? Yes? So the implication in whatever God comes, pure earth, he comes in well, that's, uh, that's how Ezekiel is describing it, but is, you've got to contextualize this in the broader context of Ezekiel's entire book, in which what he's talking about is the, 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 that the glory of the Lord is leaving the temple, and therefore it is ripe for destruction. If the glory of the Lord were in the Holy of Holies, the temple would be sacrosanct and would not be destroyed, but because it leaves in chapter 10, goes out, out the door and up onto the mountain and just goes, then the, the temple's destroyed. So... I, that, that's, I think, is the, is the point, that God's glory is not fixed in the Holy of Holies, but can move, can go up to heaven, can go to Babylon, can go anywhere. Yes? Uh, somebody asked you the question? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear. Go ahead, speak up. I was, I was going to ask if, um, if we should make a connection between this solar imagery that's apparent here and the scriptures where it says, you know, that God's face is to shine upon the people and, uh, you know, that it's shining forth from the temple. I, I think there's, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, solar symbolism used. Also in some of the Psalms has a lot of, you know, solar type motifs. I think that's, that's really quite likely, yeah. Anything else? All right, thank you.